everybody, you're listening to Chatting with Candice. I'm your host, Candice Horback. Before we get started on this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandice.com. From there, you can sign up for our Patreon account, or you can click that little link that says buy me coffee. Both things help me to continue podcasting, increase the quality of the podcast, and eventually start getting some guests in. This week, I'm really excited to have Michael Gallagher join the podcast. Michael Gallagher is a speaker that's nationally recognized for his expertise when it comes to studying the subject of transformation. He's a bit of a philosopher, a great storyteller, and his new book is called Waking Up, A Guide for Transformation. Please help me welcome Michael Gallagher. Well, thank you for joining me this morning, Michael. I really um, appreciate you giving me some of your time. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, when you reached out to me, it was um, pretty serendipitous because I was just watching a documentary on cults and I was like, this is so fascinating to me. I guess, A, how people get sucked into them and then even more so how someone who's raised in them can wake up and be like, I need to leave. Um, so when you reached out and you're like, oh, I was a part of a cult, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to I have to talk to you. I have to hear your story. Um First, I think it's important to, I guess, define what a cult is. Um, I tried doing that online because so a lot of people are now, you know, saying um, Catholicism is a cult, Christianity can be a cult, and when you start looking at the definition, at least online, like that's true. So, how do you define what a cult is? Sure, that's a great question um, because you know, I, I guess at the very root of it, you could define almost any religion that way. Mm-hmm. Um, however, what I think of as a cult and what most um, most of the time what we get into with definition of it is there's about eight criteria. And I'll just list a few of them. Sure. Um, Robert J. Lifton's uh, uh, criteria of thought control. It, he was a, um, a researcher that came out with this uh, shortly after, um, I believe it was the Korean conflict. May, may have been Vietnam. You'll have to excuse me for my ignorance there. Um, but he came out, it was, it had to do with POWs in uh, Chinese POW camps okay. and how their, their uh, mindset had shifted by being there. And they really started to believe what they were being taught. Um, a few of the things that really religiously uh, come up are generally it's a group that will follow a central leader, <clears throat> excuse me, or a group uh, that is in a central leadership uh, um, position mm-hmm. as well as uh, there's very little room for conflicting belief systems within the group. Um, a lot of cultural, uh, a lot of cultural pressure is put on the people that are a part of it. So even if uh, the, the actual dogma is not, it doesn't teach like in my own circumstance, it doesn't, the actual dogma may not teach certain things like I can't go vote. The culture of the group was such that by giving little hints at that, um, you just wouldn't do it because of the pressure, the social pressure of it. Mm. Um, and then oftentimes, uh, they will practice some form of shunning. If you're not towing the line, if you're not following uh, the steps that they tell you to, Mm -hmm. and, uh, that includes within families. Okay. So you would say like maybe, um, like the social pressure, kind of distinguishes like a cult from a, re- a religion? Yeah, I think that it has to do with um, the way it's used, the social pressure. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all have social pressure, right, to live up to norms. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I know I can't uh, walk down the street screaming at people. That's a, right. It's just it's frowned a social, upon. Right. But um, these are, it's more um, into like just your own personal autonomy. Mm-hmm. The pressure, uh, you know, really is a part of that making decisions that should make no difference uh, to other people, mm-hmm. those personal decisions are a lot of times taken away. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I was trying to watch a lot of videos um, of different differing opinions on whether or not like religions were a cult or whether they were. And for me, I think there's more evidence that most of them are um, than any of them that aren't. Uh, 
with that being said, would you say that there's like a possibility of having like a good cult, like a cult that is positive? Or do you think that they all kind of fall in the same pattern of eventually taking advantage of the followers? Um, that's an interesting question. I think that by my definition of a cult, I don't think that there's a positive to it. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as religions go, um, I, I believe one of the big um, differentiators of some religions versus others is there's an allowance for leaving or changing your belief. Mm -hmm. And when that's taken away, when, when you're told you can't believe anything else or mm -hmm. you're going to die at Armageddon, like in my case was the, um, what was told to us, other things, when that personal decision-making is taken away, that's really where it crosses the line to be damaging. I totally agree. I think that's a really good way to put it. You kind of nailed it. I think um, without having the agency to question or to leave or to say like this is – the only way. And then if you don't, that there's going to be some um, consequence of sorts, whether it's like eternal damnation or shunning and being ostracized. Yeah. I think that's, that's a brilliant definition. Yeah. And I think there's a difference, um, not to go too far down that road, but I think there's a difference between fundamentalism where it's certainly a damaging thing. Fundamentalism in any religion is not a good thing mm -hmm. uh, and a cult because even within fundamentalism, there is some capacity for personal choice mm -hmm. where within a cult environment that's taken away uh, mm -hmm. through brainwashing, mind control, things like that. So you, I guess to, um, I guess start clarifying for the audience, you were raised in the Jehovah's witness religion. Yes. Um, how, like, were you born into it or did your parents go into it um, like at a younger age? Yeah, so um, I wasn't actually born into it, but all of my life that I can remember, I was a part of it. Um, it's my understanding. My mom, <clears throat> excuse me, my mom uh, began uh, a free home Bible study. I put that in air quotes for you <laughs> uh, with a neighbor uh, when I was about nine months old. Oh, wow. Okay, so, so really young. Yeah, so it was all I ever knew. You know, the social structure there, the things that about that was all I ever knew as a person. Mm -hmm. So... I guess to me, the really interesting thing is when you are surrounded by certain ideals, especially from such a young age, and you are brought up in this world of these are the truths, how do you start to recognize or even start questioning the things around you, the adults around you, and say something's not adding up? Yeah. So one, one direct response to that is a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm, and right. that's, the sad, that's the most sad part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the for me personally, what it was is there in that particular organization. There's a standard of uh, following rules that make no sense. It's it's completely against you know your autonomy as a human. Mm -hmm. um, that just the pressure of it uh, pushed me to the point that I had addiction issues, alcohol issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mental health issues from it. Mm -hmm. So from that point, I I left believing still a lot of what they taught, but then time away from the constant pressure, because we would go to uh, three times a week, we attended the meetings um, that were about two hours long where you continuously get the propaganda. Mm -hmm. And then every single night, you know, we had Bible study or, you know, really what that was, was study or, you know, reading out of the watchtowers publications and their books, things like that. It wasn't much out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, a family study every week. And then three or four times a week, we were out knocking on people's doors. So I was completely immersed in it as mm -hmm. a child. So really to move away from that and to be able to question the immersion in it, where you have that constant pressure on your brain has mm -hmm. to be removed somehow. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever, however that is for me, it was, uh, I was eventually I was shunned and disfellowship. My family stopped talking to me. Um, and it gave, it's, it's one thing that is terrible to go through, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of gratitude for it today because it gave me an opportunity in my brain, an opportunity to just relax for a few minutes, you know, or a few months, few years and really start questioning things. So how old were you when you started? Um, I don't want to say like act up or act out, but when did, when did you start, I guess, questioning the, um, influential, adults around you? Um, so 
I think that's two different things. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's, it's interesting when you talk about mind control, because um, like any teenager, we did, you know, we did things that we weren't supposed to. And we Mm -hmm. lived kind of a double life. We lived a very dishonest life. A lot of us Mm -hmm. where, you know, you would do things you weren't supposed to, but really truly it wasn't because you were questioning because I truly had the belief system that it was absolute truth. Mm -hmm. Not being able to live up to that Mm -hmm. things, you know, things like drinking, uh, you know, smoking pot when you're a teenager, things like that. Not the ideal, but mm-hmm. things today, like if I found out one of my children was doing that, I would be horrified, mm-hmm. but it, I wouldn't automatically assume they're going to die at Armageddon tomorrow. And it wouldn't, you know, be on that level of, you know, how you have to take care of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so from that perspective early, um, mm-hmm. you know, where I, my actions were not in line with it, but really into my 20s, uh, really my mid twenties, I still believed it. Okay. And finally the pressure became such that I started drinking too much. And that's what a lot of the um, information in my book is about, is about um, how that led to addiction and alcoholism. Um, but I, I guess that answers your question, I think, does it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had, um, we had a friend growing up that was uh, part of like the Jehovah's Witness and We didn't really know a lot about it. Like we knew like, you know, you can't celebrate birthdays. We like never really understood that one. Um, And then he would kind of explain like some other rules. But I mean, aside from that, you would never know that he was like he very much like partied and smoked weed and um, definitely wasn't behaving in like the way that you would expect like a religious person to believe. Um, But I was also told that you don't like really – I guess share – well, and maybe that's different for the Jehovah's because you do actually share a lot of the religion, right? Like you're trying to constantly be acquiring new members. Like that's part – a fundamental part of the the Yeah. Yes. Proselytizing absolutely is, you know, out. But as a teenager, you don't – I mean, it's like any teenager in, you know, high school or in college, um, you don't want to be in the spotlight, especially for that. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be talking to your friends about it a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you see like a commonality between a lot of people that were joining? Because it's one thing when you don't have a choice, right? When you're you're raised in it, but it's another thing if you're one of the people that answers the door and you get someone to kind of um, convert you, if you will. Yeah, to to go into it eyes wide open. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think all high mind control groups have in common is they the people that come to it as adults and make that decision a lot of times have emotional or mental illnesses to the point that they're looking for answers that are just easy Mm -hmm. answer your problem right here on a platter. We're going to give it to you and you don't have to make these decisions and be responsible for them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is the most common trait that I've seen. And especially in retrospect, looking back at it, looking at the people that did uh, come into the organization. I, I think that's a very common thing. Yeah, that's what I I would kind of imagine as well, especially like the documentaries that I've seen. It's it tends to be someone that wants like a quick fix to a sense of belonging that they're looking for. Um and I always say like if you're looking for fulfillment in like external factors, it's always going to be temporary and superficial and you're not actually doing like the deep work. You have to have that internally and be okay yeah. being alone and be happy and fulfilled internally. So I think a lot of it is just lonely people that just want to be loved and accepted and have like a family of sorts. And then then you get sucked in. And before you know it, you're in this crazy place and it's very hard to get out. Um, That definitely describes my mom, um, Mm -hmm. who was a wonderful human being Mm -hmm. in so many ways. Um, She always, she taught us a very strong work, work ethic. She was loving. You know, we didn't have to worry about you know, going home to beatings, you know, things that are, mm-hmm. you and I probably think of as, well, that's just kind of the foundation, the very basics of being a good parent. But there were other families that I grew up around that didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but her history, what led her to that um, was one where, you know, she, she grew up post-World War II, mm-hmm. where we think of that Ozzie and Harriet kind of ideal of a family. Mm-hmm. That was not her reality. So while my grandfather was away uh, in the Navy and during World War II, her mother, uh, my biological grandmother, I, I assume she had some mental illness, um, abandoned her four children uh, at one point. So oh, wow. she 
gone. Uh, I guess social services came in uh, at, or whatever they called it at that point. Um, at some point when they had been home alone in the house, one, uh, her youngest brother was in a um, high chair for three days straight. Oh you know, my so God. Went to a county home. Um, eventually my grandfather came home, got them back. Um, so there was a lot of chaos, right? And mm-hmm. I think that, that early impression of abandonment and I, you know, thinking back on it, I think that probably had a lot to do with my mom really grabbing a hold of a group of people that, you know, in the beginning do a lot of love bombing. Mm-hmm. You really oh, absolutely. Have to belonging. Wow. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. You can't deny that that would affect the rest of your life, especially right. if you don't deal with it head on for sure. Yeah. Huh. And um, then her, it's kind of funny. I, um, it, maybe it's not funny to other people, but <laughs> um, her, her mother went on to marry and uh, divorce and remarry. I think it was five or six times. Mm-hmm. So she ended up with a total of, she was one of 18 siblings. Holy uh, cow. That kind of, you know, back and forth, just chaos, mm-hmm. right? you know, looking for any kind of stability and then, you know, being uh, socioeconomically very low, mm-hmm. low rung on the ladder. Um, that probably had something to do with it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so how would you say that being a, I guess your experiences led to you having, um, a drinking problem? Like what were like those pressures that kind of built up? Yeah. So, um, I think probably to explain that I have to explain a little bit about the belief system. Mm -hmm. And when I go down this road, it sounds so crazy to some people. I have to describe it this way. If I taught my five-year-old that the color yellow was green and I told her that over and over and over again, and I told her anyone that didn't tell her that was lying to her and wishes her harm, at some point she would start to believe it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of the, the way you have to hear the, this belief system in order to understand how a young adult can accept it. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were taught that um, any day Armageddon was coming, Uh, you know, that, all the world governments were a part of Satan's system of things. He controls all the world governments. Um, And when Armageddon does come, which is any minute, any day, uh, that if you weren't one of Jehovah's witnesses, you were going to die. Now layer on top of that, the very real belief in uh, wicked or evil spirits, that if you're not doing what you should be doing, God would allow to attack you physically, mentally, um, you know, it, it was, it was terrifying. Mm-hmm. You know, and those were very real held beliefs. Um, that coupled with some other things I talk about in the book is my father was not a witness. He was, he was a criminal. Um, he was an addict. So some, I had a lot of uh, PTSD like symptoms going into early adulthood where I would mm-hmm. wake up in the night, nightmares, uh, screaming, believing I was being attacked by wicked spirits. Mm-hmm. And I mean, today that sound, it, although it's very real to me, I know hearing it, it sounds absolutely crazy. I don't think that sounds crazy. I don't think that sounds crazy at all. Okay. So what I found was a glass of bourbon, mm-hmm. you know, two glasses of bourbon. I was able to sleep through the night. Mm-hmm. You know, that, was, that was the very beginning of an alcohol problem for me because mm-hmm. it brought some peace of mind. My, you know, my, my, my mind could slow down enough to relax. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's just like searching for something to kind of numb the overwhelming stimulus that you're just having. Yeah, I always say that's why it's so important what you expose your kids to, even like little things that you might say out of, I guess, habit or reaction because they're in just such a download phase for like, you know, the first seven years of their life that it's like anything you say, they just take as fact, especially if you're um, an influential person in like their their close circle. Right. So if you constantly tell, um, you know, little boys that every girl is you look at what's a good example. Like, I would take the Me Too movement, right? So if you say like every every man is bad, right? And you tell a little girl every man is bad, every man wants to do harm, every man doesn't want you to succeed, you'll never do as well as a man, yada yada yada. You're going to instill these belief systems into that little girl. Um, so it's very, very crucial. And I think it's really hard when you have people that are in a religion because you're often told 
you know, the internal damnation part, which is very convincing for a lot of people because it's terrifying. We were raised um, Catholic, and I remember like around the, like the Y two K thing, everyone thought the world was going to end. My aunt was in super deep, and she told us, you know, we're going to die, so you better make sure that you do your confessions. Otherwise, you're going to burn in hell forever. I remember when everyone else was celebrating the ball dropping, I was hiding in a closet, like hysterical, because I thought I was going to die because I don't think I like went to confession. I want to say it was like nine, nine or ten, and then my mom's like in the closet trying to tell me I'm, it's fine, nothing's going to happen, and like. I had all these other adults, right, like the priest and all of that telling me one thing and my mom telling me another, and I believed everyone else besides my mom. Like, you just don't know. You didn't go to church enough. (laughs) I'm going to burn forever. And that whole – like, you know, looking back, it's ridiculous. But, I mean, it's a very real real, real fear to instill into somebody. And, it, you know, co-opting trust like that and Mm -hmm. um, and then using it in that situation is terrible. And it's probably just because someone – really believed it themselves, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's true of the witnesses as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's super important. I'm a father. I have four daughters. I think it's super important, not only, you know, what we teach them by example and by, you know, how we speak to them, but also what we expose them to. Absolutely. I have kind of a funny story about that. My 16-year-old daughter who, whenever I tell this story, I have to start it this way. She's today, she's five foot 10, you know, tall, beautiful girl, long blonde hair, uh, beautiful green eyes, um, very accomplished athlete. And I tell that because now the beginning of the story is when she was a kid, little, <laughs> um, she didn't, she was a funny looking kid. She <laughs> didn't grow. Her hair didn't grow for like 18 months. And she had this, uh, just innate ability to pick up on language. So she started speaking to us at about 13 months old in full sentences. Mm -hmm. And she could speak to you like you were speaking to an adult. Wow. Just bizarre. But she had no hair and she always had this little pacifier she carried around. So one night we're, um, I'm laying on the couch with her and we're watching, she's asleep on my shoulder. She's about 18 months old. And um, we're watching a movie, probably shouldn't have been watching with a kid even in the room, right? And um, her pacifier fell out and she startled awake, hopped up, grabbed me by the collar and she looked me in the eye and said, hey, where's my effing passy? (laughs) (laughs) Even when we don't think some of that stuff is getting in, it definitely is. Oh, for sure. I'm actually looking forward to the first curse word because I think it's going to be hilarious. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if my – our – our way of dealing with that has been the best, but we've just taught them that until you're old enough to understand the social significance of what you're saying, you shouldn't use that language. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's better than a lot of what I see. We talk about bad words all of the time and what our approach is going to be because we swear, like my husband and I, we, you know, we're not, we don't have like clean mouths by any means, but how do you explain to a child that some people get offended by what is just a word? Right. Or that like you can't use it because of an age restriction. So we just kind of have to say like you can use it around us maybe, but not at school or around your friends because you're going to make other people really mad. And they're going to say why. And you're going to say, I don't really know. It's a word. Mm-hmm. My curse. Uh, it's the the idea that my children are going to say it in front of someone <laughs> is horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I guess also trying to like protect the stranger from having that awkward moment because they're not going to know how to, what to do or. You know, with kind of, I have a bit of a twisted sense of humor. And when I hear a kid curse, it is kind of funny. I think it's hysterical. I think it's great, especially when they say fuck because it's like it's like you I don't have I don't have an argument. Like sometimes there's no substitute for that word. Like that's the only word that will like satisfy you in that moment. So I get it. And I don't want to be a hypocrite, you know what I mean? I think that's like the biggest thing is I don't want to tell my kid to do one thing and then I'm doing another. Classic comedy when children or nuns curse. Mhm. So are you – like would you consider yourself a skeptic now? Like if someone's trying to like peddle you something or um, maybe like bring you into this new way of thinking spiritually, are you like arm's length kind of trying to pick it apart or are you still pr- like a positive optimistic guy? Um, well, I think that one, I've 
tried very hard to build critical thinking skills mm-hmm. because it wasn't something that was taught to us. Oh, for sure. And it's probably for, for some people, maybe it is. And that's wonderful if parents can teach that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've tried very hard to build that at the same time, what I had to overcome because I was away from that long enough that I went, you know, a pendulum in beliefs can swing from one side to the other. And so I, my, my belief system swung from that absolute belief in a cult to where I became a resolute atheist mm. because, and that wasn't balanced either mm-hmm. because I don't know, but you know, I, none of us know. Mm-hmm. Um, so today I, I wouldn't say I'm automatically accepting of what people say, mm-hmm. um, probably the opposite of that, but I definitely have a belief and I write about this in the book some, um, I definitely have a belief um, in some kind of an energy that's around us. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I meditate as a practice every day, um, which to me is a way of uh, putting myself into a, an alignment somehow with that energy. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't expect someone else to believe that because I say it. I did enough of that in my life, mm-hmm. but it, um, it gives me some peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think meditation is huge. I think everyone can benefit from it. I think it's so wild that just a short period of time ago, like as a you know Christian at the time or Catholic at the time, we were told like meditating is a sin. <laughs> it was, you know, it was going against God's work. And now you realize how ridiculous that is. Like even if you take the spirituality out of it, which I would say there's a huge spiritual aspect to meditating, but even if you want to take that part um, away from it, even just neurologically speaking, it's so beneficial for everybody, just for regulation, for your health, your mental clarity. Um, not enough people do it for sure. Yeah. And it's actually what we do now. What I do uh, professionally is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, especially since COVID, we, we released uh, my company, a new coaching engagement called Mind, Mindset of Prosperity, mm. which is uh, using meditation mindfulness techniques for stress and anxiety reduction on a business to business corporate level. Mm-hmm. We will come in and coach on that for about eight weeks with employees. And it's completely secular. It's not mm-hmm. a, you know, engaging and we're going to teach Buddhism. We're going to teach, you know, things like that, which um, today I would identify myself as a Buddhist, but, mm-hmm. but the benefits to having that extra thing in your tool chest to help regulate the things that you were just saying mm-hmm. is immense. Cause for a long time in the professional world, what we've done, our motto as a sales guy, my, our motto was always work hard and play hard. Mm-hmm. And when you translated that, what it meant was work really hard, make a lot of money, which we did. And uh, then three, four, five times a week, you have happy hours and get trashed. <laughs> right. And that was our way of giving, you know, stress reduction to people that worked with us or our customers. Or So if we're going to do that, we should be offering some kind of tool set beyond that. Mm-hmm. As, you know, so. Like a recovery of sorts. Because the drinking and the partying isn't necessarily like a recovery. If anything, you might be doing even more dam- damage to your body and your body's going to be like, no, like I need a break. Like alcohol is not going to solve this or staying up past, you know, a time that I should be in bed is not going to solve this. Right. Um, you see that a lot too on social media, which is like just this uh, hus- hustle culture where it's like if you're not constantly grinding, then you're not doing enough. Like you shouldn't be doing any- anything but eating, sleeping, and drinking, whatever your passion project is. And that's how you experience burnout. Like you have to have some kind of process that helps you decompress and like reset of sorts. And meditating even for just a couple of minutes is extremely beneficial. Like they've done studies. It's like even one minute is better than – no minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, what? Would, how do you get people started that the typical, I'm so bad at meditating, I can't meditate because that's what everyone says in the beginning. Yeah, I'm, I'm bad at meditation. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's, um, we've done a disservice to people uh, by the description of meditation sometimes <clears throat> because people go into it thinking of, I, I thought of two things. I thought of a guy in a diaper on a mountain <laughs> or I thought of a friend in high school that was sitting on his mom's couch getting high. <laughs> those two things. But really, when you explain, you have to explain to people what meditation is and what the practice of mindfulness is. And it's sitting, being comfortable in this moment to sit as thoughts come to mind, allow them to pass through instead of grabbing onto them and moving on with it. Mm-hmm. Right? So if something comes to mind, you just gently nudge it aside. And you just do that over and over again. And the practice is what meditation is. Mm-hmm. It's not that you're not going to have those thoughts, because everyone does. 
try to sit for five minutes without a thought in your mind, it, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. Like to think of our brains as this like supercomputer that's, you know, really logical and this perfect machine. And it's absolutely the opposite. <laughs> mm-hmm. What helps you with maintaining your focus while you meditate? So for me, like I really enjoy guided meditation. Those are the easiest ones for me to feel like I'm doing it the quote unquote right way, like where I leave the practice feeling accomplished. If I try to do um, other sorts where there's, it's just like silence, I don't do very well. So that's, it's interesting you say that because I have that same difficulty sometimes and I teach it. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is it's like anything else. You have to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Um, If we have a noisy house, we have four kids. So I try to get up early before Mm -hmm. it's noisy. Um, And in that the early morning time, your mind is naturally more quiet. Mm -hmm. It's coming out of bed. So early morning helps a lot. I try to give myself all the breaks in the world. Um, I might listen to some soft music at times. Mm -hmm. I'm having a really difficult time just quieting thoughts. Uh, I would listen to, I I still use like headspace and calm and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think those are great. I mean, they're fantastic. And then anytime you can get outside, you know, Mm -hmm. away from noise outside is a huge help. Oh, for sure. Do you do you have like a family meditative practice? Like, to have you you mentioned that you would now kind of identify as Buddhist? Do you kind of, um, I guess, share those teachings with your children, or do you stay away from religion? Um, I don't stay away from it, and my wife doesn't stay away from it. Um, at the same time, we definitely don't push anything like that. If they ask us a question, because my youngest, especially who's six now, mm-hmm. well, our daughters are fairly long in years now. We have 21, uh, 18, 16, and six. Mm-hmm. Have kind of a gap there. Oh, yeah. Um, but we've never pressured them to believe anything. Mm-hmm. And if, when they ask us those questions that are hard to answer, like what happens when we die? Mm-hmm. But I absolutely refuse to give an easy answer. Mm-hmm. It's okay as a parent to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just don't know. Some people believe this. Some people believe that. You know, at some point you can make up your own mind what you think. Mm-hmm. So when you ask if we have a family meditative practice, no, we don't. Um, and like anything, teenagers are, it's awfully hard to get teenagers to do anything you want them to. So, Yeah, I've heard that. I haven't had to experience it yet. So I'm savoring the moments before then yeah. for sure. Our son is um, 11 months. So super, super baby, baby right now. Can't even talk. What's his name? Oh, I don't say it on socials. Yeah. I've had the craziest stories. So like um, I'll post pictures and stuff that don't show his face or like, you know, blur it out. And everyone's like, what's his name? Or can we please see the face? If I told you even half of the stories, like it is crazy. So I've had, um, I I guess like the most recent catfish story because there's like a catfish story like every day, like every single day. And um, it's people like extorting money like you wouldn't believe and people falling for it. So it goes back to people um, needing a sense of purpose and belonging and love. So like they do these crazy things and everyone's like, how do they fall for it? So this person had sent, um, I think it was $25,000 to somebody that said they were me stuck in Ghana. And because I don't have any photos online of me and my child because I'm just trying to like avoid anything like this from continuing to happen. But the person yes. found a picture of me and photoshopped an Asian baby in my my arms and then photoshopped fake passports with me and that baby and was like, this is proof that I'm stuck there. So I'm like, holy cow. And it was like, it was so obviously <laughs> photoshopped that again, it's like, how did this person, I feel terrible, but at the same time, how did you fall for this? So if there were pictures of me and my child, it would just make it that much easier for people to do these crazy kinds of scams. But it's yeah, and that, you know, I didn't think about that with you know your very public uh, face and very mm-hmm. you know public your profession is. Mm-hmm. I didn't really think about that with your child, but that would be difficult. It's nuts. It people are very clever when it comes to manipulating others. Like <laughs> the sky is the limit with their creativity. Do you think that we're teaching? Um, I mean, there's a whole generation, obviously, you know, my aunts and uncles and people that are older, my kids' grandparents that 
will buy into almost anything they see on Facebook. But do you think we're teaching critical thinking skills well enough to young people when no. it comes to what they believe on social media? No, I don't think at all, period. So I think we're seeing like the utter collapse of critical thinking, um, especially if a parent – and I don't mean – to like guilt parents because I know par- like not everyone has the luxury of having enough time with their kids to know what's actually happening, right? Like there's single moms that are working two jobs. There's two parents that have to work, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week and they don't get that quality time with their kid. And that's really unfortunate. But the consequence of that is, is you're leaving these schools and other people to step in as your where you're supposed to be as a parent, right? And influencing them and guiding them and teaching them. So what I see in schools is just a lot of programming. I think you get almost um, punished or dissuaded if you do speak out, if you're like, well, what about this? Or I disagree with this theory, right? Whatever it is, especially when it comes to like social justice, um, mm-hmm. nonsense that's being spewed everywhere. So if you're going against the grain, then you're problematic. And especially at like a young, vulnerable age, again, you just want to belong to the herd. So if you're sticking out, then that's not a good thing. So I think you're almost rewarded to just go with the flow and drift. And that's going to be very problematic down the road. So I think it's important for parents to like know what their kids are learning and ask like, what did you learn today? What are your teachers saying? Did you? And then if they're age appropriate, talk to them about what you're seeing happen in the world today and ask what their opinion is. And then just keep asking questions, which will eventually make them start asking questions, right? So you can say, well, I believe X. Mm-hmm. Like we can take um, like the Black Lives Movement, movement statistics that they're – not statistics um, – theories that they're pushing out to everyone, which was initially, you know, black men are being slaughtered in the streets. Like that's what they were telling everyone. And then everyone's getting outraged because you're seeing these videos and it's just one after the other. So there's this sense of believability. And then you get all these people that have these really intense emotions and then they start, you know, protesting and rioting and acting out. So of course that's going to upset you when you see these violent videos because, you know, violence is a terrible, terrible thing. But if you were to ask, okay, well, when you say that it's happening in unspeakable numbers, where are you getting that information? And when you start asking these questions, you get down to the point where, you know, the number is usually less than 20 for the year, for an entire year with like millions of interactions. And of course, that's still wrong, not like condoning that, but you just have to keep asking questions. So it's not critical to get swept up in emotions you know what I mean? And then just believe a narrative because someone says it because an organization that's trying to get money says something. Um, And what I see online is a lot of young people, like a lot of millennials, a lot of Gen Z that are just leading with their emotion and letting logic fall by the wayside. Um, So again, it has to go with like monitoring your kids and getting them to ask questions and be okay with being the outlier and not necessarily going with the herd because that's not necessarily the best way to go in my opinion. Yeah. And I think that you see what you're describing there. <clears throat> it's all, it, you hear the term echo chambers all the time. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's what we see on both sides of almost every issue now, especially mm-hmm. with social media, where if people did have some critical thinking skills to, to ask, especially why do I believe this? Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think I try to be uh, have gratitude for almost anything that's happened in my life because there's something you can learn from it. Mm-hmm. In my own uh, experience, it was asking that question, why do I believe this? Mm-hmm. Over and over again about so many things. And still today, I ask myself that question, why do I believe this? I hear them saying it to me, but why do I believe it? What are mm-hmm. the facts? Mm-hmm. Um, and teaching people to do that um, and question the source of the information, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, Politically, I mean, we've never been more divided in our country than we are now. Totally. And a lot of it is because of, it's something that you go through and I see a lot of it in politics is cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's very difficult to have two conflicting uh, values and hold on to both of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, you know, if I truly believe in democracy, if I truly believe that, uh, elections matter mm-hmm. if I, you know just to put it in a face right now what we're dealing with right now mm-hmm. but if i have the 
emotional, you know, uh, I'm holding on to the emotion of this one candidate that I really want there. Mm -hmm. Those two things don't coincide when Mm -hmm. you have an election showing, you know, one president is on his way out, one is on his way in. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of cognitive dissonance. You see it on the other side as well with all kinds of issues. For sure. So I think that's a, um, that's something we need to be looking at a lot more. Yeah. The why is huge. And I mean, I did this probably later on in my life. I think I kind of just accepted my programming and my upbringing. And and then that was my belief system until I met other people that were challenging me on certain things. So maybe like um, unhealthy behaviors towards like jealousy. Like I was um, overly jealous, like to the point where it was harming my relationships and you have to keep asking like where are these emotions coming from and just keep asking why until you get down to like the basic principles and then you realize a lot of it has to do with you know the adults that raised you and then what they told you was acceptable behavior growing up and then when you realize well maybe that's not healthy or beneficial and i'm in control of my life and i can change that belief um I think that's also a huge part too, right, is admitting like when we're wrong. So it's really hard when you have a belief system and then you realize that doesn't necessarily align with like your higher self or who you want to be and then changing that. So a lot of people would rather just say um, – oh, there's like this good quote in Game of Thrones and I'm sure I'm going to butcher it, but it's like when Theon decides to kind of turn into the bad guy and he's like, you know, you can still leave. And he's like, after the things I've done, it's too late to turn back now. So it's almost like you've created this persona and rather than have the social consequence of changing your mind, you would rather just stick to your guns on that. Um, So I don't know if that's just, you know, a hardwiring thing, if that's just a personality thing. Like some people are just more willing um, to admit their flaws and be vulnerable in that sense or – if that's experiencing enough pain to also change or combination, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I think some of it also has to do with um, whether or not we identify our own values. Mm -hmm. Right. It's um, because it's so easy to live with someone else's values and to Mm -hmm. be following someone else's path. If we haven't really done some work around what are my core values Mm-hmm. The why, and that gets back into the why as well. Why do I believe this? Why do I act this way? Because when those are in, not uh, congruent, our values mm-hmm. and our actions, that's where unhappiness comes from, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That, at least that's my belief. It, it, if I'm not living, and maybe it's what you said earlier about, um, now I, sorry, I can't remember the term you used, but it, something along the lines of uh, living to your true self or- Oh yeah, your higher self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. I think that's the that's kind of what I'm saying there is when we live in alignment with our own values, that's where happiness comes from. Yeah, I think there's that. And then also what I don't see a lot of now is is respecting other people's values and the fact that they're gonna differ from yours. Like everyone has a different path and a different purpose. And just because you don't align on anything or everything, then you know, they must be your mortal enemy. So that's also crazy. And it, again, it's just leading with your emotions. Like your emotions and logic just they don't line up. It's almost like um with like a horse or a dolphin. Like only one of the hemispheres can operate at one time. So one of those operating systems is, is gonna be in charge and then you can flip and then it'll be the other. And that's why meditation is really important as well is because it also helps balance that out with like your emotional regulation. Um, but that's what everyone aims to do right now, especially on social media and for sure. And just news in general, right. Is like make you feel. And what you said about, you know, respecting other people's viewpoint, even if it's their values are different than yours. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's obviously boundaries, right? Like mm-hmm. some things are right and wrong. Right. Like you can't go murder people. Right. Um, but I, I think that so often instead of looking at the person and the value of the person, we value them by their beliefs mm-hmm. because that's what we see. But I can respect people even in my own family that differ from me politically, religiously, mm-hmm. because they have value beyond that set of beliefs just mm-hmm. as a human. That's one of my core beliefs about, you know, the universe we live in is we have a right to be here as an individual, just because we are, we're a part of it. 
right? Mm -hmm. That inherent value in a person doesn't go away because they hold a political ideal or, you know, a religious idea that's different than mine. Mm -hmm. And it's really, we can get it back to, you know, trying to look at commonalities in people too. The Dalai Lama talks a lot about that. We're Mm -hmm. 98% the same, but we, we focus on this 2% that we're different. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't heard that one. But it's true. You just find like that one thing and then that's that's all you want to focus on. So how did you come to like to find Buddhism after having such an intense experience with the Jehovah's Witness? Because I would imagine that someone, most people that do get out like stay away from all religion afterwards. Yeah. I, well, I, I've connected with some ex Jehovah's witnesses witness groups just to get a feel for what it's like for other people. Mm -hmm. And it runs the gamut. You you have people that become atheists. You have people that just jump right back into a different religion. You have people that end up in some other form of mind control Mm -hmm. and you have people like I was who I dealt with substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. I I mean, pretty heavily. I drank heavily. I had, I was an alcoholic. I was a cocaine addict. And so um, I, I ended up in a treatment center because of that, that's kind of a big bomb to drop at, you know, like minute 50. In the <laughs> Sorry. No <laughs> worries. I do talk a lot about this in the book. Um, and so I ended up in this treatment facility. And though I never found a path in what I was taught in recovery through traditional means, as mm-hmm. far as 12 step groups, a lot of people do. Um, a Buddhist uh, path of recovery made a lot of sense to me because it didn't force upon me the belief in some higher power, some God, some, and that works for a lot of people. It Mm -hmm. didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I uh, kind of started down the path of Buddhism. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, A lot of the new research when it comes to addiction is pointing out, and it's not to like bash the 12 step system because it does work for some people, but it's definitely not um, like a fail safe by any means. And it's kind of one of those what persists or what you, um, oh, I'm going to butcher it. What you resist persists. Yes, what you resist persists. So they are kind of saying it's not a triumph to be completely abstinent and like have that in your mind all the time, like that ruminating, like, am I going to relapse? over and over and over again. Like that's not you beating the addiction because um, a healthy way to look at it was would be to not be thinking about it, right? Like it's not like someone who doesn't have an addiction issue when it comes to any substance. Like I'm not like worried like what if I have a glass of wine tonight? Like it's just it's just a neutral thing because I I'm in control of that. So it's um I guess looking at like a new way to heal of sorts, but again, no one has like a silver bullet for it yet. No, I think that um, something big that I've I've thought a lot about is identity. The Mm. self-identity has a lot to do with it. And that follows with what you were saying about um, 12 steps and what we, what we resist persists in that a lot of the people in whatever program where they begin to get sober and stay sober, Mm -hmm. they end up, um, re-identifying themselves in some way, in some big way. Um, They change their lives to the extent that what they focused on before is completely different. And that's a lot of times what it takes to overcome addiction. It seems like in my experience, does that make sense the way I said that? Yeah, because to me, any kind of, any addiction, whether, you know, it's drinking or drugs and you can be addicted to anything really um, these days. So I think it, like, it's all a symptom. Right. Like to me, it's a, it's a symptom. There's something else that you need to face and tackle. And sometimes you don't even know because it depends on like how spiritual you want to get. But, you know, there's like studies with epigenetics and there's family traumas that happen at like a very young age. Like when you were talking about your mother, um, a lot of the times like you don't even remember some of the things that are influencing you as a person now. So, It's really doing a lot of introspection and therapy or whatever your, you know, your outlet is and then figuring out what that is and then the other things will fix themselves. So I think when you focus just on the drinking, like I just can't have a drink, well, why are you doing that in excess? Like what are you trying to accomplish by drinking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, And I think that focus of 
you know, in a lot of programs with recovery that focus on not drinking or, you know, not using that, that is the epitome of what that expression that you used, what we resist persists. Mm -hmm. Your focus is on that all the time. And that has to shift. It has to become a neutral. Mm -hmm. It has to become something that, yeah, I know today I'm not going to go drink. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take that chance, but it's never, well, I should say practically never on my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, Instead, it's, you know, what are, what are things I can learn about myself? What, what ways can we adjust the way we treat other people, the way we treat ourselves? How much compassion do we show to ourselves, to other people? You know, that really fundamentally rewire our brain. That changes, that, that has changed my experience compared to uh, 12 step groups. What really that was for me was no, 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 no. And it just didn't work. Yeah, that's understandable. So given your, like your just life path, if you will, what's your opinion on if you see someone that's in just an unhealthy spot, right? Like they're not everyone you meet is going to be in a cult, but let's say they're in a cult or let's say that they have like these ideologies that are doing them harm or they have, um, you know, a substance problem. Like how do you help someone help themselves? That is such a tough question. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Um, because there's a, in both in cults, you know, and in uh, addictive issues, it, there's a fundamental like blindness to the problem. Mm-hmm. And getting a person to wake up to that is so difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, even, you know, I think of my family, I have a brother still today that, I, I don't have anything to do with. He was my best friend growing up, but you know, he won't speak to me because of wow. the religion, but there's a fundamental blindness, you know, in him to the idea that what he's been taught could possibly be wrong. Mm-hmm. It almost, I, I'm going to come around to kind of reverse engineer to answer that question. If I can, Yeah, I think it has to, it has to start with almost never directly confronting at least when with religion and with a cult. Um, when it comes to addiction, addictive issues, this is a different thing. But because the walls go up, when you're talking to somebody that's been in a cult and in a religious organization that has their mind, you know, really under a control, you know, the shields go up immediately mm-hmm. if you directly confront it. Mm-hmm. Um, so showing them that, you know, a happy, good life can be led away from that <clears throat> mm-hmm. which most of them are taught, almost every cult teaches, nobody else is happy except us. Mm-hmm. So showing, you know, just by living well and showing them that a successful, happy life can happen helps. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if there's, you know, back in the 70s, there were these deprogramming groups that, you know, would they got into legal trouble because they would kidnap people and, you know, deprogram them for several weeks at a time. Um, I don't, well, you see that happening in China right now, right? The deprogramming camps, but no one's – they're not getting any media time at all right now. So, yeah, it still happens. So I don't know that there's a, a real – I have an answer for what you said, mm-hmm. what you asked. Um, but I know that directly, at least with mind control with a cult, directly confronting it and saying to a person, hey, this is a cult, if they're already completely engaged in it, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the answer is. There's, there's the truth. I don't know. Yeah, it's so interesting because that's like obviously what you want to do. Because to you on the outside, it's it's so clear, right? It's like, how does this make sense? How does any of this make sense? Like you're part of something that's not doing you any good at the end of the day. But I, I totally agree. It's like when you try to just point out the obvious, you get very defensive because it goes back to people not wanting to admit that they could have possibly been wrong or flawed in their thinking. And I think it always comes back to like that person just has to figure it out on their own. But And there, there has to be some kind of uh, empathy involved, not even on – I'm going to tell you what worked for me when Mm -hmm. I first started questioning. Um, One of my daughters uh, had been born and I was just, you know, I had left the group 
and I had been disfellowshipped or excommunicated, shunned by my family. And my wife asked me a question. She said, if they told you to shun our daughter, would you do that? Mm -hmm. And it, it caused me to really put it in a personal light. Like I, I had to, and I, that sat in my mind for a long time. And I went back to it over and over again. And I couldn't, it just, I couldn't make sense out of it. I could never imagine doing that. Mm -hmm. And so questions sometimes will get to the, you know, if, if a person has the capacity to really think about it, very personal, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Like yeah. I think so. I think so too. That's, um, my husband does that all the time to people. He can get inside some people's heads like better than anyone I've ever met. I love just watching him do this with people. So um, for a while, we tried helping my sister out with like everything under the sun. She's just had like a very um, – and a, by all means self-inflicted but very hard life. So we've tried to help and step in a bunch of times and I've seen him do it with her and he just like asks question after question and – I mean, she's probably one of the most stubborn people I've ever met because she's still in the exact place that she started. Um, but I've seen him do it with other people successfully. And it's like you – he'll sometimes pose a question that you just almost see a light go off in the person's mind. And they're like, whoa. Like right. I didn't think of it that way before. But again, you can't just say this is the truth or this is what you should be right. thinking or doing. It's like, well, what about this? Well, why do you think that? And you just keep getting back down to, you know – fundamentals. Yeah. And at, at some point, if they can start asking a question themselves to themselves, mm -hmm. that seems like it would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just curiosity, trying to instill curiosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Well, um, before we wrap up, do you want to tell our listeners where they can buy your book, where they can follow and support you and um, stay up to date with everything you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the book you can find on Amazon. It's the easiest place to get it. Uh, Waking Up, A Guide for Transformation. Um, and if you want to go to wakingupthebook.com, it's kind of a back way into my website where you can find all my social media, things like that. But by all means, go go buy the book. It's a good book. Uh, and my kids keep outgrowing their shoes, so I like it when people buy it. <laughs> well, thank you again for giving me your time today. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Candice. It was a pleasure. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have the time, please rate and review, and you can always hit subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. I hope to have you back.